7.9 training. This is called Presentation of the Precepts of Mind Training. Okay? So this is a, a summation of, of what we, uh, how we should act in order to bring Lojong into our lives. So it says, Najo Tamchi Chikita, which means accomplish all yogas through a single means. Or, all practice should be done in one way. Right. So, so what brings all this together? All the, the talk we've been having through these last uh, couple of days. What is the essence of what it's trying to say? Well, the essence of what it's trying to say is that we should act with compassion and pure motivation in everything we do. That's actually what it comes down to. Whatever action we do, eating, walking, working, sleeping, we should have only the motivation to benefit others. So, so that's basically what it's about, is that our whole life, no matter what we do and what um, ordinary actions we perform, we should perform everything with this motivation that may this be of uh, benefit to all beings. So, Underlying everything that we do should be this motivation of compassion. If we can cultivate that throughout the day in all our activities, then when we are faced with challenges and difficulties, spontaneously this um, attitude of, of patience and, and of compassion will arise. If we only expect it to arise just when the opportunity comes, it will be too late. So we have to practice this, this motivation in all activities, including those which are totally unchallenging, so that our mind becomes accustomed. And then when we need it, it it's already there, because we have practiced. So this is a very, very important point. Throughout the day, we should cultivate awareness, and compassion. Then all our activities, even very ordinary activities, become meaningful. There's no ordinary activities anymore. They are all the actions of a bodhisattva. You know, one time somebody said to me, why uh, talking about my own Lama come to Rinpoche? He said, why is it that when he just picks up a cup to drink, it has so much significance? Whereas for us, when we do all the very fancy things, it doesn't have much meaning. And, and the reason was that, because everything he did, it felt like you were watching a Buddha. Not because it was studied and, and grave, but because it was you felt that underlying awareness and compassion in every action. It was just natural, it just flowed. So all of us, we, we must practice like that. Try the best we can to remember that we are now going to act as a bodhisattva. Inwardly, outwardly we look much the same, but it will permeate slowly everything which we do, just naturally. Otherwise, as I say, if we just try to be bodhisattva-like on, on uh, you know, special occasions or when we are really being challenged, it won't work, it's too weak. So we have to practice at all times our best to be aware, to be compassionate. Compassionate also to ourselves, not just to others, all sentient beings. And we are also a sentient being. but just that attitude of kindness. Uh, overcome all errors through a single means, or apply one remedy in all adversity, or correct all wrongs with one intention. You take your choice. Um, but what it means is that when bad things happen to us, people hurting us, 
accidents befalling us, the glaciers, the, the negative emotions increasing, or loss of interest in practice, which is a very difficult one for many people. We should think of all, all the beings in the world who are suffering likewise. How sad. Even if we explain Dharma to them, they would not be interested. So we should wish that on top of our own suffering, we could, should, could also take on their suffering. This is back to Tonglen again. Sending out loving kindness and compassion. So Tonglen is the antidote to all our misfortunes. You know, when, when something horrible happens to us, instead of getting completely engrossed in our own suffering, that is the time to realize how many other beings in the world are suffering likewise and even worse at this time. And the sincere wish, oh, if only I could take on all their sufferings at this time, and they would be free of their sufferings. Then that puts the whole thing into perspective. I mean, when not so terrible things happen, but things happen which upset us, I always think, if this were the worst thing that was happening in the world at this moment, then this would be a pure land. You know, we have to have perspective. So it's very important when we do come across great suffering to recognize that this is part of something which we share with so much of the world and the sincere wish that therefore others would be freed of it if only we could take it on, on their behalf. So that transforms something which otherwise would be a big obstacle and another cause of our self-pity to become something so much vaster, so much greater and part of the path, very much part of the path. There are two tasks, one at the start and one at the end. So, I'm waking in the morning, this is the start, I'm waking in, in the morning, we should resolve to turn all actions of body, speech and mind towards cultivating compassion and bodhicitta. You know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and many Lamas, one of the things they recite every morning are the eight verses of a mind training, in which it talks about putting oneself low and others high, taking on defeat and giving others the victory and so forth. Because it reminds us, it sets us right for the day. You know, and then whatever happens during the day, we can... Um, recall uh, our aspirations of the morning. It's very important in the first in the morning uh, during our practice or with our practice to also set the tone for the day. Here we have another day, another chance to practice. Now during this time I also will be very careful to keep this awareness, to keep my compassion and so forth. And the eight verses are a very useful text because there's only eight verses. And they're very basically self-explicit, unlike this text which is uh, fairly, um, what shall we say, esoteric. <laughs> I mean, you need commentary to understand what, what the aphorisms mean. Uh, whereas the, the eight verses are very simple and uh, very quickly said, but they set the tone for the day. So therefore, on awakening in the morning, we should resolve to turn all actions of body, speech and mind towards cultivating compassion and bodhicitta and be vigilant throughout the day. That means we have to be careful, we have to be aware, we have to be conscious during the day, not wasting time. 
whatever actions we are doing, we should try to cultivate mindfulness. We should try to be more conscious. And whatever people we meet, also recognizing that each one is our opportunity. They are our helpers on the path. Because whether they are kind to us or whether they are mean to us, all of that is helping us. And we wishing every single person that we meet, may you be well and happy. The first thought on seeing someone is just wishing them well in your heart. Recognizing that just as we wish to be happy, all beings wish to be happy, whoever they are. Just as the dogs here, you know, if you pat them and speak to them, their tails are wagging like crazy, they want to be happy. Of course they do, who doesn't? So to remember that, just as we like people to be kind and well-wishing to us, we also must extend that to others. And, and stop thinking about ourselves so much. As uh, Deborah Chancey Young said yesterday in the, in the DVD, um, you know, Shanti Chan, quoting Shanti Deva, that if we want to be happy, then we have to wish the happiness of others. If we want to be miserable, we should just think about our own happiness. And so this is our opportunity during the day, whoever we meet, really from our heart, to see them as, as, as people who want to be happy, no matter what they're like, you know, and, and just to wish, have that goodwill. So that is part of being vigilant, being, being conscious during the day, and not just, you know, being like half sleepwalking. And then, at the end of the day, we look back on our activities during the day. What have we done with this day, walking on our bodhisattva path? And if negative thoughts or actions or speech have arisen, then we should regret it. And we should determine not to do that again. Now, it doesn't mean, as I say, that we we constantly flagellate ourselves and, and get into a spin and get angry with ourselves and upset and all this. That's useless and, and it's just accumulating more negativity. But we should sincerely regret, oh dear, yeah, right. Now, really from my heart, in the future I will not do that. I will be more careful, more conscious. I, I will not act in that way again. That's how we learn, you know, and that's how we begin to grow up and get rid of our childish reactions and responses and become adults, <coughs> spiritually speaking. I mean, outwardly we look very adult, but inwardly many of us are still children. Four years old. <laughs> And, and then whatever is positive in any that we have done. You see, always in Buddhism, you regret the, the negative, but you also rejoice in the positive. As I said, you know, while we are pulling out the weeds, we also have to pay attention to the good plants. We shouldn't ignore the good plants thinking, if, oh, I, I did something good, if I think that was a good thing to do, that's pride. It, it's not. It, it's... it's um, uh, an appreciation for the goodness within us. It's very important to appreciate the goodness. Now, you don't get proud over it, but we have to encourage ourselves. And if we're always focusing in on what's wrong, then we just end up feeling very depressed with very low self-esteem. And self-confidence is essential, as Shanti Deva says. You know, we, we are spiritual warriors. We have to arouse ourselves to a belief in our goodness. So therefore, at the end of the day, we, we regret and, and determine not to, again, repeat anything negative in body, speech, or mind. If we have, you know, very um, negative mind patterns, we recognize that and, and we're sorry about that. And we say, next time we'll try to do better, we'll cut them off and replace them with positive thoughts. 
But then we also, um, we, we think the positive we did, anything good we did, we dedicate any merit which may have come from that to all beings. So also we are striving towards goodness, not for the sake just of ourselves, but so that we have something to dedicate uh, for the welfare of the world. Because the world is very deficient in, in positive karma at this time. So anything we can do to, to help boost the positive karma levels, uh, we should strive to do. So therefore, we have to remember the goodness and, and dedicate that for all beings. <coughs> then, ah, whichever of the two occurs, be patient. <coughs> or bear whatever happens. So make sure that we do not fall prey to the eight worldly concerns. Uh, this is we dealt with yesterday, gain and loss, and praise and blame, and uh, good repute, and <coughs> bad re reputation, and um, pain and pleasure. The, these, these opposites which bind us in a worldly sense. So we should be careful that whatever actions we do, do not fall prey to these, these worldly concerns <laughs> about our reputation or about gain and loss and pleasure and pain. Do you know, not get too caught up in all that. So therefore, we should take fortune and misfortune equally on the path. We shouldn't be swept up when things go absolutely right and everything is just how we want it and then totally cast down when things go wrong. All is illusory. You know, it's back to this thing that everything is very dreamlike on one level. And the result of karma. And it's impermanent. You know, now things work, and tomorrow they go wrong. Then they go wrong, then they go right. You know, impermanent works for us as well as against us. You know, if we're going through a bad patch, everything is impermanent. You know, I mean, impermanence just is. It's not good or bad. It just means things change. And they're changing constantly. So we shouldn't grasp at, at misfortune, thinking it, this will never change, because it will change. Just as good fortune, sometimes it's, it's going to go again. You know, it's, it's like, you know, a wheel is always turning. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, but it keeps turning. So therefore, if we are only happy, happy when things go right, and, and all worried and depressed and stressed out when things go wrong, it is an indication that we have not really understood the Dharma. That, that, that the real understanding has not really entered our hearts. So there should be a certain level of equanimity. As I said at the beginning, samsara is like an ocean. Ocean has waves. Waves go up, waves go down, waves go up, waves go down. That we cannot stop. It's samsara. Even the Buddha got sick. Even the Buddha had people throwing stones at him. Even the Buddha had people criticizing him. That's samsara. But how we respond is up to us. And this is why the Dharma is uh, compared to a boat. Because you're not getting rid of the waves, but you are just riding the waves of life. Not being submerged in the waves, tossed up and down. We can have an inner equanimity that when things go right, that's nice. And when things go wrong, that's okay also. We'll deal with it. This is very important. Uh, so therefore we should have patience towards however things turn out. Whether things go well or whether things go badly, we should have patience. Forbearance, tolerance, equanimity. Uh, if we only practice if we can only practice during good times, or only practice during bad times, because a lot of people come to the Dharma because they're suffering, 
And then when things start to go well, they forget all about the garment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the Buddha talks about suffering a lot, so he understood me. <laughs> And so then when things go right, you know, we get swept away and distracted again by samsara. So if we can only practice when everything is perfect, and that's when I, I can do it. Or if we only are interested and drawn to the Dharma when things go wrong, then it's very unbalanced. You know, when, when I first became a nun, uh, I went to Thailand. That time I was 21. And uh, I, I was with, uh, staying with a friend of mine called John Blofeld, who was a great expert on Chinese Buddhism especially, although he was very devoted to Tara. And um, he introduced me to this Thai princess called Momsma. And so she took me off to her um, Oceanside estate which was, and I had this little Thai, beautiful Thai polished uh, house in the middle of a lotus lake with three servants. And then just through the mango groves was this white silver beach, which was hers, right, with palm trees and, and the ocean. And um, I, I felt very guilty because I had just renounced the world. <laughs> to her, you know, I, I feel very uncomfortable in, in all this, you know, luxury and indulgence. And, and she said, exactly this, she said, look, you didn't ask for this, you didn't seek it, it's come to you. So while it's here, enjoy it. When good things happen, that's nice. But when you are in, you know, you go away, you're in poverty, you're in difficulties, you're in trouble, that's also good. Why are you making this discrimination? And uh, I thought that was very wise. Uh, so when things, because sometimes people hanging out in very funky places, they feel comfortable, but if they're in, you know, more upbeat places and posh places, they feel very uncomfortable. Other people feel very comfortable in five-star hotels, but if they're in a local Daba, they feel, you know, they're worrying about all the germs. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be equally at home everywhere, whatever is happening, it's okay. That's the state of mind to have, not to discriminate so much either way. But whatever happens, we accept it and we work with it, and it's fine, because that's what's happening in this moment. And so this is also very important for our mind to be, have that equanimity and patience under all circumstances, the good as well as the bad, the bad as well as the good. Ah, Nipo Sodan de la Sun. Okay. Guard these two, even at the cost of your life. So the two things which we have to always guard, we must never ever give up. Okay? I think Tibetans took this very to, much to heart during the Communist takeover. Uh, the precepts and commitments presented in, in the teachings in general, in other words, refuge. The refuge of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, we never give up. And commitments on this particular mind training, lojong or bodhicitta. So the two things we must never give up are our refuge and bodhicitta. Even at the cost of our lives, we will never abandon the Dharma. Which is why, of course, so many lamas and monks were imprisoned during the uh, communist times and still today. Uh, because even at the cost of their lives, they would not pretend even to abandon the Dharma. So this is a, a very strong... I mean, nobody's going to force you to. I mean, but nonetheless, it's, it's that commitment that the Dharma is more important than this particular lifetime, and I will never surrender it for any reasons whatsoever.
It, it has to be something held very tight in the heart. And bodhicitta. No matter how much people offer me or how much people threaten me, I, I would never ever abandon my refuge and the bodhicitta. From now until enlightenment is reached. Not just this lifetime, but all the future lifetimes. Train in the three hardships or difficult challenges. Okay, so this is where we have to train. Uh, there are three difficulties. It is difficult to recognize when afflictive emotions arise. In other words, when we get uh, in thoughts of anger, or greed, or jealousy, or just very strong delusionary mind, and so pride, and so forth, it's hard for us sometimes to recognize that. Uh, partly because also uh, we, we can coat it with some other coloring so we don't recognize that really we're feeling angry. We, we give it nice names. And also because by the time we've realized that it's happening, we, we've been carried along. It's very hard right in that moment to recognize this is anger, this is grief. And this is why we need to learn to cultivate mindfulness so that we're very conscious of what thoughts are coming up into our mind without justifying them, just seeing them very barely. And, and recognizing when this is a negative thought, a klesha, and when this is a neutral thought or even a, a positive thought. If we catch it right at the moment of arising, then it's very easy to get rid of it. If we wait until it's gathered force, then we are swept along. So it's very difficult to catch it at that moment of arising, but if we can do so, then at that moment of arising and seeing, it, it of itself uh, transforms into a, a much more powerful energy and is no longer negative. But we tend to um, be very unconscious of what's going on in our minds. And often we are busily cultivating all these negative emotions without even recognizing what, what is happening inside our mind. So the first difficulty, therefore, is to recognize when these negative thoughts arise in our minds. Then it is difficult to turn them away and overcome them. So, all right, now I've recognized actually I'm really quite angry. I'm, I'm really irritated by this. Or I, you know, I really want to reach out and grasp this or whatever. Well, okay, now I've recognized it. Okay, so that first step, that difficulty is gone. Second difficulty is to, to turn them away and overcome them. Right, now I'm really mad, but on the other hand, I'm justified in being mad because. <laughs> and, and so therefore, that, that ability to not only recognize the negative emotions as they come up, but actually deal with them skillfully. So, I mean, the one thing which we should not do, of course, is just to suppress them and pretend they're not there. Because that just makes them continue to boil inside until they erupt again. The most skillful thing to do is just to recognize them, accept them, and release them. And if one can do that, then that's best. But if not, then one has to try to supply an antidote. For example, traditionally the antidote for feeling angry is to meditate on patience and tolerance and understanding and compassion. For greed, to uh, cultivate uh, contentment and an appreciation of what we already have, gratitude. You know, we are always thinking about what we don't have, but it's very helpful to be, to appreciate what we already do have, so much compared with so many. And, and to be content with that. 
What more do we really need? We already have an abundance. As people find out when they start packing up. <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. Jealousy is to rejoice in the happiness of others. You know, if somebody has something or has been given something, or acquired some reputation we think we, we should have had, then to be happy for them and, and to be pleased for them. This is called mudita. <laughs> It's one of the four um, immeasurable meditations, actually. After loving kindness and compassion comes a joy in others' pleasure. Not jealousy or envy, but a real delight that they got these things, even if we have wanted them. <coughs> and likewise, any of our negative emotions, there, there is an antidote for that, so we should apply that. And, and watch that negative emotion dissolve. But the third difficulty, alas, is it is very difficult to sever their continuity. So that even if we've dealt with it one day, the next day it comes up again. So, as we said, dealing with our afflictions, dealing with our klesha, as they are called. Klesha means something which which hurts you, like a very hot sun is a klesha. You know, it burns the skin. It, it has the idea of something which torments us. And normally people are not conscious of how tormented we are by our negativities. We think even they might be pleasurable. That's how reverse we are. But if we have any of these klesha in, arising in the mind, the mind is not peaceful, the mind is not calm. The mind does not access that, that wellspring of inner joy. And so in all Buddhist schools, in all Buddhist schools, from the time of the Buddha to the present day, one of the big challenges has been to deal skillfully with the klesha. If you think of the wheel of life, you know, that big wheel of life, at the very center, at the hub, are the, the snake and the pig and the chicken. And, and they are representing these poisons. The snake is anger and the chicken is greed and the pig is delusion. Okay. And, and they are biting each other's tails. <laughs> and, and so they're going like this. And therefore the whole wheel of samsara keeps turning. Why does the wheel of samsara keep turning? Because of the glacier. An arahant, one who has entered nirvana, has completely and utterly uprooted now and forever all klesha. They can never be angry. They could never be greedy. They have no self-delusion. Therefore, they are free. Anyone who demonstrates anger or greed or delusion is not free. They are still in samsara. So therefore, in Buddhism, the dealing with the glaciers, um, transforming them, uprooting them, and uh, finally eradicating them forever, is the primary, uh, the primary task. Because one of the glaciers is our, our, our self-delusion, our, our belief in a constant, unchanging, permanent I at the center of everything. That's the fundamental klesha which gives rise to our greed and grasping and our anger and aversion. All our play, pleasure and pain, everything depends on fulfilling the desires of this illusory sense of I. So therefore these klesha's are a very, very important part of the path. Dealing with them in, in a skillful manner, not suppressing them, not pretending they're not there. Not giving in to them, but, but transforming them and, and uprooting them finally from our mind stream. So, therefore, it advises in the morning 
Put on the armor. When afflictions arise, recall their antidote. For example, the antidote of anger is patience and so forth. Counter them and resolve, from now on I will not allow afflictions to arise in my mind. And so that then comes the story of Geshe Ben and his black stones and his white stones, right? Um, the black stones and the white stones were a, a way for him to be conscious of what was going on in his mind and what were negative, how much negativity there was in the mind which normally we, we are not even conscious of. So this was his very skillful method of, of being alert to what was actually going on in the mind so that he gradually could replace his black pebbles with white pebbles. It wasn't that he was suppressing the black, but that he was noticing it. And in noticing it, he could replace that with a more uh, wholesome thought and then put in a white pebble. So, Denko Kien Se as we saw uh, the video last night, Denko Kien Se says, when glaciers arise, face them and question. This sounds like Shanti Dev, right? Uh, where are its weapons? Where are its muscles? Where is its great army and political strength? Emotions are just insubstantial thoughts, by nature empty. They come from nowhere and they remain nowhere. So why are we always overcome by them? They have no strength, they have no army, they have no weapons. <coughs> They're just thoughts, empty. Vacuous. Why are we so overcome that from these thoughts, these emotions, they erupt into speech and action? We shouldn't be afraid of our glaciers. We're much stronger than our glaciers. So, in the morning we put on our armor. Our armor is the armor of mindfulness and resolve and bodhicitta. And then we say, okay, glaciers, come up, show yourselves, let's have a look at you. Yeah. You're pretty puny when you look at you. You think you're important, but you're nothing, you're just thoughts, empty, bubbles. If we really look at our, our glaciers, they, they get a shy. And try to hide away, they don't want to be looked at. Because they know. You know. If you really face them, they look so stupid. You know, like like those those mask dancers, you know, um, they look very powerful with their mask, but you take it off, it's only a little mum. Adopt the three principal conditions or have recourse to three essential factors. Right, so these are three things which we need. Um, first uh, is a qualified master to instruct us. If we learn any skill, if we want to be an artist or a musician or a sports person, or even learn computers, we need instructors, we need guides, people who are more advanced in these skills than we are, so that they not only show us how to do things right, but they also can correct our faults, so we don't waste time. <coughs> Otherwise, it's very easy to pick up bad habits and think it's okay, and you don't notice that they're bad habits. Like, you know, you hold your instrument wrong because it's the most comfortable. But actually, that might be comfortable, but in the end, it won't help you to play the instrument better. And so forth. So, it needs to have somebody who knows and can see more clearly 
then we can see what is the way to go. But of course, in this day and age, it's not so easy. Because also, most of the truly qualified lamas are very busy. They're always running around the world. And uh, they have, if they are well known, they have millions of disciples. And so you never really, it's very hard to get a one on one relationship. But nonetheless, um, if that can happen, then it's very useful. It doesn't mean that you can say, oh, you must go to this lama, this is the best lama. That, that isn't true. Uh, there are different, um, different teachers uh, are helpful for different people. It's not that there's one teacher who is a universal teacher. Um, different people have different connections with different teachers, and different teachers are, are more helpful for some people than for others. So that's why there's no one teacher in the world who everybody goes to. It couldn't be, because you know everybody has different needs and has a different karmic connection also with, with different people. But to find a good teacher that you truly trust, who you believe knows you better than you know yourself, and is therefore able to guide you skillfully. It's not so easy nowadays. It never has been easy, actually, to tell the truth. But if one can find such a one, then that is very, very important on, on the spiritual journey. It's very hard also to, to discriminate, because many people are taken in by charisma. Or the fact that some Lama has so many disciples, he must be good. <laughs> um, so the second thing we need is a practice we can apply our mind to with faith, enthusiasm, and intelligence. This is the other thing. Um, we must have a, a practice which really speaks to our own heart. It, it's very important because we have to dedicate ourselves to this practice with, with faith, intelligence, and um, enthusiasm. So therefore, it has to be the right practice for that person. One of the, the greatnesses of um, the Tibetan form of, of the Dharma is that it has so many skill and means. It has so many approaches, so many different techniques, so many different ways to come to it and practice. So in the beginning, it becomes very confusing because it's, I, I often say that Tibetan Buddhism is like a, a Dharma supermarket. <laughs> you know, you go in and there are so many things on display. Well, what do you choose? You know, which is the best? You, there's no best. One time I, I was in this, this supermarket, I guess in California, and there were 48 different kinds of yogurt. <laughs> and it was a small supermarket, it wasn't a big supermarket, just a little supermarket. 48 different kinds of yogurt. You know, and, and so like that, you know, it's, it's, it's almost too much. You, you don't know what is for who, which one, you know. Each one tells you they're the best, <laughs> the most healthy, the most organic. <laughs> um, so like this, at the beginning, uh, the, the Tibetan path also can be very confusing because there are many approaches, there are many uh, practices, and each lama, um, you know, naturally will exalt his own. And... Uh, <laughs> So people can get very confused. So the, the downside is that it's, it's, it's a bit... Like if you go to a Zen center, there's a Zen meditation, that's it. You go to a Vipassana center, there's Vipassana, right? You like it or you don't. But with Tibetan Buddhism, there's so much that if you don't, you don't um, connect with that one, try this one, or try that one, or try something else. Um, so this is its richness. But it's, it's also initially very um, confusing for people. Um, so it's, it's important to find the, the, the approach and the technique which speaks to one's own heart. We are not trying to become Tibetans. 
I think this is very important to remember. Tibetan Buddhism was absolutely perfect for Tibetans, living especially in pre-communist Tibet. But it doesn't mean that every single thing which was very important and uh, meaningful to t medieval-minded Tibetans is necessarily going to be very applicable in uh, modern 21st century non-Tibetans. So again, this is a problem. To find um, a practice which really one can take into one's heart and really develop, that is meaningful and not going against um, our, our modern uh, way of life. Something which we can take with us and use in our daily life. Because we, we are not going to be going to live in um, you know, medieval Tibet. We are living in the midst of, you know, often in the midst of, of cities, with families and jobs and relationships, how can we, what practices can we use which will enhance our life as it is right now? And not just when we're in retreat. So this, there's not any one practice one can say, oh, we should do this. Because for some people that's very helpful, for other people, it doesn't connect with their hearts. But we have to look and find what is really meaningful for me, something I can do and carry with me everywhere. So that if you're in New York, you're just at home practicing as if you're in Dharamsala. This is very important. And then the third thing is relative leisure and resources to uphold our practice. In other words, place to live and food and clothing. So it's important that we have a certain level of security that we are able then to, to live and to practice. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have, this doesn't necessarily mean just being in retreat. But it's understood that as human beings, we do need to eat. We do need to have shelter. We do need to um, have clothing. So those basic needs have to be fulfilled. Beyond that, we don't need that much. Actually, we can... Um, of course, you're all here, so it's not so relevant, but if one was uh, speaking in the West, uh, one would definitely say that one can simplify one's life. Um, especially if one is speaking in somewhere like New York or San Francisco, you know. How about simplifying your life? Here you have already simplified your life just by coming here. But when we think of it, our actual needs are very simple. We need somewhere to live. We need clothing for our bodies. Something for the winter, something for the summer. We need some food which will nourish us and keep us healthy. Beyond that, we don't need that much, as you have discovered. And so, instead of giving all our energies to earning more and more and more to get bigger and bigger and bigger, everything, we have more time left over for um, cultivating our practices and cultivating whatever other things we're interested in. Just recently, we, Monica was telling me that we had these two very charming young people come uh, to see me. They were English. And one was a teacher of music, and one was, uh, she had a, a degree in horticulture. So naively, they said, is there anything we can do to help you? And uh, as it happened, we were trying to get our landscaping together. So we said, well, yeah, if you're really interested. 
So the poor thing spent the next three or four days, even in the rain, uh, trying to uh, replant our gardens and uh, get our, our landscaping in, into shape. But the young man, who was a teacher, he had found, he had been teaching, of course, as usual, in, in the system. And then he, he drew back a bit, and he only worked for three days a week. And he found that because he was only working three days a week, even though he got paid less as a result, his expenses were much less too. He didn't have the transport backwards and forwards. He didn't have to buy um, extra food. He didn't have all these different expenses which happen if you're working full time. In fact, he found that he came out equal and he had so much time left over. He had four days a week in which he wasn't working. He could do other things and only three days a week in which he was working. But when he tried to persuade his friends that actually uh, economically it worked out the same, he wasn't losing anything, and he had so much more time, and therefore also working was much less stressful because he only had to do it three days a week, they wouldn't believe him. They, they couldn't let go of the fact that we've got to keep working, 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 otherwise we'll fall apart. It's interesting. You know, because we are, we are convinced by our society that we have to keep working, we have to keep working, we have to keep working, otherwise we will become destitute. But actually the expense which we um, then en encounter just in keeping working uh, balances out if you stayed at home for some of those days. So it's interesting. Really what we need in this world is not that much. And then it gives us all this other time for doing more meaningful things and without becoming stressed out. <coughs> anyway, support. So, we need three things. We need a qualified master, a practice we can apply our mind to, and relative leisure and resources to uphold our practice. Yama Mepa Nam Sun Gong. Contemplate the three that are free from degeneration. Or meditate on the three uh, that must not degenerate. So there are three things which we must always try to um, cultivate and develop. Undiminished devotion to our master, meaning that if we do have a heart guru, we should see them as the Buddha at all times. We should cultivate pure vision towards our teachers and not be looking always for their faults, but see that everything they do is a manifestation of pure Buddha activity. In this way, the reason why masters are considered important and devotion to masters are considered important is that, well, the, the traditional uh, example is that uh, that the sun is always shining. The sun is always shining. And however hot the sun is, if you put a piece of paper under the sun, the most it will do is to become a bit dry and crackly. But if you put a, ma a magnifying glass between the rays of the sun and the paper, in no time at all it starts to go brown and then smoke and then burst into flames. Likewise, the blessings of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are always there around us. But it's very hard for us to, uh, to plug into that. But a, a human teacher, which is a Buddha or Bodhisattva of compassion appearing in human form for us, they, if we open our heart to them, because they are in human form, then very quickly it ignites the, the fire of our, our, our pure insight and the, the heart can burst into flames. So it's considered, therefore, that they are the intermediary between the cosmic Buddhas and ourselves. And devotion to them is much easier because they're people. But it only works if our devotion is open and pure and uh, basically uncritical. 
And so this is the reason why also we have to be very careful who we take as a teacher. Because the other flip side of it is that if they're not, if they are false gurus, then a disciple and guru both together uh, jump into the chasm. So one has to be sure that this is a, a qualified teacher. And then once one has made that, that, that real hard connection, one has to drop one's critical faculties as much as possible, unless it gets too outrageous, um, and uh, accept them as a pure Buddha activity here for our sake. And that devotion then uh, gives rise to very deep insights and understanding very, very quickly. Trumpa <coughs> Rinpoche said it was like a corridor with two doors. And the Guru's door is always open. But if we keep our door closed, then there's no connection. So we have to open our door through our, 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 our devotion. So therefore, undiminished devotion uh, to our master, um, undiminished joy in cultivating bodhicitta and practicing lojong. So we should de take delight in practice. It's very important that, you know, in something like Lojong, which we're always talking about, you know, putting oneself last and others first, thinking of others' happiness, not thinking of our own happiness, and so forth, it, it can get to be very um, oppressive. People take, you know, hitting away at the self-cherishing mind that it, it reduces all joy in the world. As I say, you know, if you think, oh, God, it's hot, I'd like an ice cream. Oh, this is just a self-cherishing mind. Think of all the people in the world with no ice cream. Um, and then you get guilty every time you even smile at yourself. And that's not what it means. Actually, to, to, to travel the path, we must have joy. The Buddha said, the Buddha said, if this was a path of suffering, it would still be worthwhile to travel this path because of the fruits. But it's not a path of suffering, it's a path of joy. So how much more should you put your enthusiasm and effort into practicing? Actually, if we are really practicing, tremendous joy. You know when people go into retreats and they really feel they're putting their whole being into the practice? They're just illumined. It is a great joy because we're coming back to our source, which is infinite joy. So sometimes things are hard, sometimes things, obstacles arise, sometimes our mind is very difficult, sometimes it's very boring and tedious, but ultimately, we're chiseling away at all the hard rock of our, our self-cherishing mind which causes us all our problems. And, you know, so slowly, slowly, we begin to come back to, to the real source of our being, which is joy. When we talk about emptiness, it sounds very mean. But actually, emptiness, if you really, emptiness just means freedom. Freedom from grasping, spaciousness, openness, like the sky. You know, those, those paragliders, you know, they are, they are just, just there in empty spaciousness. That's how the mind should be, exactly like that. You know, they're conscious what they're doing, they're very alert, and yet they're within this open, vast spaciousness, poised. That's how our mind should be, just like that, like a paraglide. And they have a great time. <laughs> and then the undiminished wish to help all sentient beings. So down to the smallest insect, we, we should wish to help sentient beings and not to harm them in any way. You know, that, that wish for their well-being. May all beings be well and happy. All beings means all beings. No exception. All beings. May they be really well and happy. This is our wish. 
And so this we, we have to keep with us always. We should never allow any of these things to degenerate. Our devotion, our, our joy in cultivating bodhicitta and our practice, and our undiminished wish to help all sentient beings. These three we must not allow to, to grow less. They should grow more and more and more as we become um, acquainted and, and acclimatized to this way of thinking. It, it makes the mind become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And mind and heart is the same in, in Buddhism. The heart becomes bigger and bigger and just embraces all beings. And there's no, yes, I embrace all beings except that one. No, I don't accept that. <laughs> all beings. The great freedom. <clears throat> Sorry, we should get on with this. Trauma is Sundan de Right. We end up with the three insects, this because it's all threes and fours and fives, you know, it looks like just one thing and then you know. <laughs> um, endowed with three inseparable factors, three things which main, maintain inseparably. So this is easy. Make sure your body, speech, and mind are never separated from virtuous activities. Right? So, in other words, at all times, we should try to maintain our mindfulness, maintain our bodhicitta, and in general, under all circumstances, at all times, we should try to make sure that our body, speech, and mind are virtuous. And not, and, and be alert for when clashes arise in the mind stream, to say, that is a clash. That is not virtuous. You uh, may start to train impartially in every field. In other words, train wholeheartedly by saturating ourselves with this mind training, with this lojong. Remain resolute in our decision and train without hesitation. Stay single-minded in our practice and not be distracted by other activities. That means that we, you know, of course we have other activities and we give our focal mind to that. But nonetheless, underlying it all is this practice of lojong. So, under all circumstances, there is this underlying um, saturation in, in this mind training of, of being really having bodhicitta and compassion for others under all circumstances, no matter what we're doing. We have to saturate our whole mind and heart with the practice so that we become it. You know, in the Tibetan tradition, the, there is um, uh, three levels. Uh, first of all, one um, studies or hears, traditionally it says hears, to some gong. To is to listen, but it also means just to study. <coughs> traditionally, Tibetan people, mostly they, they heard discourses, they didn't want so much into reading. But it means to, to study some, a subject. Then some means to think about it, to investigate it, to intellectually go over it in the mind so that we really understand it. And then gom. Gom is often translated as meditate. But one lama, he said, you, you, you hear it, you think about it, then you become it. Right? So this is what we're saying here. With the Lojong teachings, you hear them, you go away, you read other books on Lojong, you think about it, you try to apply it to your lives, and then eventually we become saturated with it. We become it. We're no longer practicing it. We are it. Our whole mind is saturated with these ideas. 
this is what we have to do. Then, then the Dharma and our minds merge. It's very important that our hearts and the Dharma merge together and we become the Dharma. And this only happens through practice, 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 practice. As I said before, it's like a musician or a sports person, you know? A very proficient musician or, you know, a top professional um, footballer or cricketer or whatever. At their peak, it's no longer them. The, the game or the music, it's, it's playing through them. But it's because they spend hours, months, years practicing, practicing, practicing until they become it. And then they're still practicing. I have never met any Lama who said, okay, I've got it, I'm here. <laughs> they always say, oh, I'm just like you, I'm still practicing. Well, they are like me, still practicing. I mean, they're there somewhere, we're still helping along. But the point is that our whole life is a practice. And we never give up. Until we're saturated. And even then, carry on, carry on. Tokje Ninji Tarpaja. Be liberated by both investigation and analysis. So, first of all, we investigate which of the afflictions, which of the klesha, is most dominant in our mind, and then we apply the appropriate antidote. So we've done this before, right? It's very important to work out which of all the many klesha's rampant in our mind stream, which is the one which is the most prominent, the most difficult, and then determine to, you know, read and study and investigate the antidotes for this and start applying them. Otherwise, if it only stays up in the head and doesn't come into our actual actions, uh, it never is not going to help. Merely knowing all the antidotes to, to anger is not going to cure anger. Then analyze the way that deluded projections arise in relation to the specific situations. We should observe whether the affliction arises or not, recognize it and apply the antidote. So in other words, if for example we, we get angry sometimes, we should analyze which situations or which people bring up particularly that anger in us. Sometimes we are not angry, we're feeling very peaceful, then we find ourselves in certain situations or meeting with certain people and anger arises. So then we should look and analyze when that happens and when we've recognized when these particular, what particularly presses these buttons, we should then apply the antidote. So we should look and, and, and become, you know, very, um, uh, when, when we know there are special situations where we become especially greedy or especially jealous or especially angry or whatever is our particular problem, then we should be on guard. That's the word. We should be on guard when these situations arise, which are going to um, bring up this particular klesha, and, and we should be uh, very mindful and, and careful at that time to see that we, we recognize then when this, these clashes arise and that we immediately apply the antidote. Otherwise, it just carries on round, 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 and we're endlessly blaming everybody else for our problems and never recognizing that the real problem is ourselves. You uh, go. Do not be boastful, or do not expect appreciation. So, do not feel self-congratulatory about our own good deeds or learning or realizations. 
So, I mean, when we have learning and, uh, you know, we get some realizations or experiences in, in our practice, it, it shouldn't make us feel proud. Of course we should, uh, you know, appreciate that something is, is changing inside our mind stream and, and be, you know, happy about that. But it shouldn't make us therefore feel somehow we're superior to other people or that it makes us something very special. Because then that is just another klesha, right? So we should be on guard not to um, make ourselves puffed up uh, when finally uh, something is actually moving inside our psyche. And do not expect recognition from others for any kindness we may have done to them. So again, uh, you know, don't expect others to be grateful. We are not doing things for the sake of others in order to experience their gratitude and kindness and appreciation. We are doing things for the sake of others in order for their own happiness and because, you know, it's a nice thing to do things for others. But we shouldn't worry whether or not those people are grateful in return. That is totally irrelevant. So therefore, if we do a great kindness and people in return do not appreciate it or even slander us in return, we shouldn't worry about that. It doesn't matter. That's their problem. It's not our problem. We did what we felt was good and that is enough. So we don't act in order to get recognition for others for our great good qualities. We just act because that is the right way to do it and that is enough. And this is enough because it's now tea time. <laughs> so um, now this session we are going to just answer a few questions. I can answer all of this for me. But we will deal with some of them. Um, maybe we will we'll start. This is a much more difficult part, I think. People ask very difficult questions sometimes. Um, and I have to avoid putting aside the difficult ones and only answering them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we were starting this one, which I just received because it's an interesting point. I'm not sure I know the answer, but it's an interesting point. Um, what to do when genuinely applying these teachings and things backfire horribly? For example, when spontaneously helping someone out of a genuine impulse of selfless generosity and kindness, we hope, <laughs> and they, after reaping the benefits, turn on you and behave abusively towards you. Today, especially among Westerners, many people can have uninhibited psychological problems that erupt only when someone is suddenly extra kind to them, almost as if they cannot comprehend an act of compassion done without an ulterior motive, misinterpreting kindness and acts of generosity as an intrusion into their space, or a, as a sign of weakness indicating um, an invitation for them to dump their negativities, negativities on the giver. Sometimes behaving as if the giver uh, is now their worst enemy. Can it be this act of help coming from pure intent has actually made things worse? Because by doing so, you are robbing the, pe the person you are helping from receiving the lessons they need from the fruition of their own karma. What is called idiot compassion? So how to unite wisdom, compassion in spontaneous action? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there are two things here to my mind. One thing is whether or not our uh, acts of kindness and compassion are, are really genuinely selfless or not. 
because although we tell ourselves, oh yes, I would be uh, selflessly kind and generous, uh, there might have been an ulterior motive we're not expressing to ourselves, in which case people pick up on that. And we act to that. So that's the first thing. We always tell ourselves that we're being uh, you know, altruistic, but are we? Secondly, it's true that the uh, great bodhisattvas, like uh, the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara, have eyes in all their hands. Uh, this expresses that though they are reaching out to benefit others, they also understand how to benefit others. They have that wisdom along with their compassion. So we understand what is appropriate behavior given the circumstance of the person who we wish to benefit. Uh, that only comes with having great clarity of mind and uh, is what we are trying to develop. Not only that we are here to benefit beings, but that we understand how to benefit beings. And sometimes how to benefit beings means not outwardly doing anything. Um, so that is, is a point, that we are not always in, in the Buddha Dharma, they, we are trying to develop wisdom. Wisdom here, in this context, means clearly seeing. Seeing clearly what is appropriate in every situation, what is the appropriate behavior. That has to combine with an open, compassionate heart. So, like two wings of the bird, we fly to enlightenment. And if we only develop one side, then it's like a lopsided bird which cannot fly or will just keep circling round, round, round and will not be able to reach its goal. So, anyway, okay, we are nice to somebody and in return they abuse us and, and accuse us. Ultimately, that's very sad. Maybe the way we acted was therefore not as skillful as we imagined. But beyond that, we should not expect gratitude from people. As it says in the text, you know, the fact that we are kind to others doesn't mean that we should expect them to be grateful. And so whether people are grateful or ungrateful is irrelevant. We have done our best. So the real question which he is, is putting here is whether or not uh, we uh, should act knowing whether we, what we are doing is the best or not. And so that is, is the question which we have to ask ourselves. It's not the matter of the, the person concerned. Um, how much what we do actually does benefit that other person or not. So that's why we need to have this, uh, this understanding and not have what she, uh, as Trumpa called it, idiot compassion. Um, genuine compassion sees the whole situation very clearly and applies the, the correct remedy for that moment. And this uh, is something which uh, only comes with uh, great inner understanding and great wisdom. It, it's, so on, the, on our relative level as ordinary human beings, then we can make mistakes. And if we make mistakes and our, what our good intentions are misinterpreted, so be it. If they were genuine good intentions. As I say, our main problem really is that we think sometimes that we are doing something out of genuine goodwill and maybe there's other things going on underneath that that we are not uh, accepting. So, in this world this is samsara. And if we do something with a, a genuinely pure intention and it is taken the wrong way and it might even increase the problems of the other person concerned because, as she said, they feel they're, you're invading their personal space or whatever, then you learn from that. Be more careful, don't invade people's personal space. Unless they invite you to.
beyond that one. We have to be sensitive to the needs of others, not just to our own uh, altruistic impulses. For example, if somebody is, uh, take an extreme example, if somebody is homeless on the streets, then just taking them in immediately and, and, and taking care of them, maybe that's not at all what they want. You know, maybe they, they would regard that as being extremely intrusive to their way of life, which is how they want to live their life. We can't tell people how to live their life. And so, in this way, we have to be very careful, also, discriminating in how we benefit others. Are they willing to accept this benefit or not? And if they don't want it, we shouldn't impose it on them. So in this way, we have to also become more sensitive, isn't it? And we learn from our mistakes. And if this happens again and again and again, then you can take it that it, it, it is our mistake. Mm -hmm. Just do an hour, 
and add a few more prostrations just in case. And uh, count that. You know, like however many you're going to do in an hour, you, you presume you've done that many. Without counting one, two, three, like this. So, so you don't have to think about it. You're not counting, you're just doing your prostrations. The end of an hour, somebody goes bing, and you can, uh, you know, add a few more and then bring the session to an end. So for, for some people, they find that much easier because otherwise we get into numbers, and numbers are not the point. It's considered that if we keep repeating things over and over and over, it gradually it begins to sink in. That's all. There's no magic in the numbers, per se. It's just that it encourages us to keep going. If we think we have to do this many, then it, it's, it's a counteraction to being too lazy. That's all. But to accumulate merit is very important, and if you're worrying that it sounds too much like a kind of merit bank account, we must remember that we're doing this, we're accumulating merit not for the sake of just ourselves, but the sake of the whole world. The whole world is desperately in need of merit right now. Good positive karma, positive energy, that's what it means. Short hand, they say merit in English, which is a difficult word. In, in, uh, in Sanskrit it's punya. In Tibetan it's sonam. Merit sounds a bit like something at school where you get little merit badges, you know. But it doesn't mean that. It means a positive energy to, to release into the world, which has so much negativity. I'm sure if we, we could see the, the mental pollution on this planet, it would be so thick. The violence, the greed, the aggression, all the things that people just watch as entertainment, but to speak of what they actually do. And so, therefore, it's very important to counteract that by sending out light, by sending out positive thoughts and, and positive energy into the world. So this is why we are accumulating merit. Not so that we can have a merit bank account, but so that we can, we can help to heal the psychic nature of this world, which is very, very heavy at this time. Very heavy, very dark. It's something we all can do, that much. Whatever we do which is, is, is of a virtuous nature, we can dedicate that for the world, for the whole world, for the whole planet. This is a good thing. We should not think that, you know, it, it's, uh, what does she say, uh, uncomfortable. What is uncomfortable about creating something good for the world? Nothing to be uncomfortable about. We should be uncomfortable about all the negativities we, we, we continue to put into the world. That we should be uncomfortable about. About being, giving out virtuous things, why should we be uncomfortable about that? We should rejoice in that. Thus speaks Tenzin <laughs> <laughs> So, um, can we absorb or take away someone's pain and suffering when they themselves aren't aware of their own pain? If so, how can I do it silently? If I do it silently, is it helpful uh, for them at all or somewhat? Well, this is, I mean, Tonglen, uh, the practice of Tonglen, of taking on other suffering and giving out our own infinite well-being, it does not depend on whether or not the person knows about it. Um, we don't have to tell them by the way. I send them an email and today between <laughs> four and six I'm doing tongue there for you. We just do it, and it is silent, and we don't need to tell the person. Uh, and whether or not they are consciously aware of their suffering, if we see that what the, how they are acting is actually a cause of suffering for them. 
then we generate our compassion and do torment. It doesn't matter whether they know about it. I mean, normally people don't know about it. You just do it quietly from your side. And whether or not it benefits them would depend, I think, on the sincerity of how we do it. I mean, I'm not going to, into this long story of how, when I was young, I, I nearly burned to death. Um, but nonetheless, uh, through my mother's pure prayers to take on my suffering and give it to her that I should be released from suffering, um, as a result, even though my whole back was burned off, I felt no pain. And I had no scars. And uh, I was in hospital for weeks and weeks, but I never felt any pain. I was very small, so I didn't know you would feel pain. And it was only years and years later I asked my mother, you know, it's very funny, you know, then we were talking about that time, and I said, I didn't feel any pain. And, and she told me that she had prayed um, that, you know, first of all, that I wouldn't die. And secondly, she had kidney trouble at the time. She was in terrible pain with kidney stones. But she prayed very sincerely that all of my pain, I was too small, young to, pay, to suffer, she said. Please give all her pain to me, and uh, I will take it all on myself. Don't let her suffer. So I didn't. And I mean, absolutely I'm sure that that's because of her own pure motivation. She would rejoice to have my pain. That's a mother. The Buddha, when he discusses loving kindness, says, just as a mother loves her child, her only child, thus must you extend your loving kindness to all beings. But this is the, the, the intensity of what we must do for, for our tongue then. I mean, she herself didn't get my pain, but I didn't get it either, because her motivation was so pure. She would rejoice to have my pain, in addition to her own agony at that time. That's what love is about. <clears throat> So whether people know about it, I didn't know she was she was praying for that. But it, nonetheless, I, I, my pain went. I didn't have any. The doctors thought I was very weird. <laughs> they said, "Oh, you're a very brave little girl. You must be in extraordinary pain." And I said, "No, there's no pain." And they looked at me because my whole back was just one great big blister. Um, and if you burn even the tip of your finger, how painful it is! My whole back was off. And no pain. I thought I had a great time in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we're talking about, is, is the intensity of, of the genuineness of our really be rejoicing if we could take on the pain of others. This takes, you know, unless you're a mother with your child, it takes uh, practice. Hmm? from self-created fantasies and fear, paranoia. How can I get out of this problem and live a, a peaceful life? Well, you know, meditation is intended to help us to uncover these layers of uh, pain and fear and paranoia in our lives. It's not an instant fix. And we have to also ask ourselves why we have this fear and this paranoia. And maybe at certain times, for certain people, meditation might be counterproductive because it stirs up a lot of stuff which otherwise would be, has sunk down and is not being uh, looked at. Ultimately, we have to look at it, but sometimes it needs expert guidance to know how to look at it if it's very strong. So, for many people, sometimes before they start with seriously meditating, they might be uh, well advised to seek psychotherapy and uh, look to see what is the cause of, of fear and, and uh, paranoia in the psyche. What is causing this? 
If one knows what is causing it, then one can start working on it, looking at it, bringing it up, facing it, facing our demons. But it depends what those demons are. Ultimately, all of this is, is just the creation of our deluded mind and is really empty in its nature. But for many people, it's very, very difficult for them to deal with this if they are alone without expert guidance because uh, things come up and people don't know how to deal with them in all truth. So, I mean, depending on, on the causes of these, uh, this suffering and this fear, first we have to discover why why it is, what it is, what's the root of it. And then from there, make a decision which is the best route to go on to um, bringing this into our conscious mind and, and facing it and dissolving it. Because um, it's something which is very prevalent, especially in our, our modern society. People's minds are very unbalanced. And sometimes these things can uh, be eradicated through, through meditation, through, through <coughs> making the mind calm, allowing these things to arise and, and viewing them and accepting them and naming them and allowing these to be released. And if one can do that, then that is very best, undoubtedly. But if they are too overwhelming, that, that the, the person concerned, it just increases their, their fear and their paranoia, then I think they need medical help first to, to be able to deal with these things, to work out where they come from, why they are here. I mean, ultimately, of course, it's all empty. We, we know that. All of these thoughts, these fears, they, they are all empty in their nature. As, you know, as it was said, they don't have arms and legs, they don't have weapons, they don't have anything, they can't really harm us. But, to say this and intellectually accept it is one thing, but to experience it when these demons arise from the depths <coughs> is another thing, because we, we don't believe that they are just masks dancing around. We believe they're solid, they're real, they can harm us. And in that case, it, it's helpful to have someone to hold your hand someone experienced. And if one cannot find um, a teacher to do so, and nowadays it's quite difficult to find someone who will do so, who is experienced enough to do so, then it might be better to seek um, professional help. That's my opinion. If our minds are not balanced, sometimes meditation makes it worse. I'm just picking these up. So. Um, I realize my ex-husband and his girlfriend have been a great impetus to work on myself, but it's been many years now and I still have no desire or hope to forgive or like them, even the slightest. Well then, lady, you haven't understood the first word about Dharma. Instead of nursing our vengeance, our grudges, the whole point is that we say, thank you so much for being a wonderful spiritual guide for me, to help me, 
to learn how to forgive. How can we learn how to forgive if we have no one to forgive? Isn't it? So, to learn how to have an openness, the, 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 the nobility of heart to be able to forgive, we need someone who has hurt us enough that we can use them as our helpers. So therefore, instead of feeling resentment towards your husband and his, his present lady, you should feel gratitude because now you have something to practice on. They're your teachers. This is what the whole point is about. So, as I keep saying, it's easy to like people who are nice to us. That, anybody can do that. That doesn't take anything. The sign of any genuine spiritual understanding is to love our enemies as, isn't it? Who said that? <laughs> Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. <coughs> Can someone mention that sometime? <laughs> and today is Easter Sunday. So let the sun of our loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness rise in our hearts on this day. After all the darkness of Good Friday and Saturday, when everyone was in despair, everything was so dark and, and so heavy, everything was lost. And on Sunday, the sun rises, the sun of our hope and our resurrection. This is what the Dharma is about. However dark our minds may be, however closed our hearts may be, this is not their true nature. So why limit ourselves? <clears throat> why limit? When we have a challenge, like someone's really hurt us hard, then we stand up and say, okay, this is my practice now. If you don't want to, then don't say that you're a Dharma practitioner. Why pretend? Be miserable. <laughs> Suffer. <laughs> Go ahead. Nurture all your grudges and your, your, your desires for vengeance. And may you be well and happy. <laughs> she does, that you love her for her, 
and not just because when she's good and does what you want her to do. It's very important for children to know that you just love them because you love them and not for what they do or don't do, or accomplish or don't accomplish. It doesn't matter what they do, you will love them. It is very important for a child to know that, that under it all, they can, re they can trust that you will always love them, that you're there for them as a person, not what they do, but who they are. So, having children is a wonderful, if you have children, it's a wonderful teaching. You know, we have all this talk on patience, compassion, loving kindness, and wisdom, and all these things. But when you have a child, that's where you're practicing. How to bring up that child with loving kindness, patience, compassion, understanding, and also discipline. They have a wonderful, wonderful practice. You want to sit and meditate, the kid wants to play. <laughs> you know, so you play. That's your practice. So those of you who are parents, um, please understand that you should have great gratitude for your, your offspring in really training you on the Bodhisattva path. There's no better training, really. Except if I'm not going up. <laughs> One of these philosophical questions which has no answer. Why has existence created so many sentient beings if the purpose is to reunite with it? I'm not sure we're reuniting with it. Is it a game of the existence? I mean, sentient beings are here, who knows why? And uh, our ultimate uh, goal is to recognize our true nature, which has gotten a bit covered over through the millenniums. But even when we recognize our true nature, it doesn't mean we cease to exist. Why the, the whole universe exists, who knows? But it's here. And it's a great learning ground for us. We all have many lessons to learn. And so here we are at school, learning what we need to learn until we graduate. <laughs> and so get on with it. I'm sure these are all Indians asking these questions. With all due respect, the Indians have very philosophical minds. And they're always asking awkward questions. <laughs> uh, um, who knows? I haven't uh, When meditating on awareness of awareness, how does one recognize when meditating that now one is resting in the state of open spacious awareness. How does this state relate to the wisdom understanding of the nature of reality or ultimate bodhicitta? Well, it is that state of resting in open spacious awareness is uh, the nature of reality and ultimate bodhicitta. So that's how it relates to it. How does one recognize when meditating that now one is resting in a state? Um, the point is that while one is resting in a state, one doesn't need to, to think, now I'm resting in a state. As soon as you think, oh, now I'm resting in a state, you're not. <laughs> uh, that's the point. It, it's um, in that way non-self-reflective. The, the mind rests in that state of open awareness without having to comment on the fact that it's now, now I'm in a state of open awareness. When, when the mind is in a state of open awareness, it knows it. But it doesn't know it through the conceptual mind. It just knows. I mean, and then, of course, as I say, the, the thought comes, ah, this is it, and then you've lost it again. You know? But 
um, how can I say, it, it isn't, it's just, it's, it just is, it's a state of being. And so therefore, the minute we start to comment on it, or reflect on it, or analyze it, uh, we've stepped down from that state again. And we're back into conceptual thinking again. But, I mean, the mind knows. I mean, there is, a, in one way you could say there is only knowing. It's a state of perfect knowing. Not knowing about, just knowing. This is why in, in, in Tibetan school, Rikpa, Rikpa literally means to know. So it's a state of knowing, perfect knowing. And it's the opposite of being asleep or being unaware. It is the opposite of being spaced out. Even though it's very spacious, but it's not being spaced out. You're totally, absolutely, completely present. So, but at that time, there's no commentary on it. It's just, it just is. But then the ego catches it, right? And says, aha! Um, <laughs> Um, intellectually, we might get some understanding about the emptiness and dependent origination. Yes, we might. But how can we directly perceive, realize the limitations of our sense consciousness and go beyond them? Well, this is it. You're resting. When you rest in the nature of the awareness, that's it. You already answered your own question in the first part. Um, you know, we, we perceive it through, through resting in the nature of the mind. That is the very nature of the mind, is, is the, the unity of, of emptiness, of shunyata, and um, luminous cognizance. It, it is the ultimate, the ultimate quality of our pure primordial awareness, from which everything else then emerges. So that's why the quick way to get there is to look at the, the mind. Um, the other way is to analyze external phenomena, which will take you 20 years to leave the conversation. I seem to have got it this morning, don't I? <laughs> Please explain the following, especially with reference to the non-atma view. What the I is, is nothing other than what is merely imputed by the mind. Okay. How the I exists is extremely subtle. Right. How the I exists is so subtle that it's easy to think that the I doesn't exist at all and for into nihilism, it can be very dangerous. I wonder who wrote this. The prasangika view of dependent arising is very subtle. It is not that the I doesn't exist, but it's as if it doesn't exist. It's extremely fine, extremely subtle. Well, the point is, as far as I understand it, at least from a culture point of view, uh, is that our whole view of I is based on our misconception. We take many um, aspects, put them together, and, and think that this is an I. And the problem is not that we for example, put it another way. Okay, the Buddha, who was our ultimate example of someone who lived on this world egolessly, nonetheless said, I. <coughs> and he would relate incidents from his childhood. Or, I remember when I was a young prince sitting under the tree. Da, 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 da. And he would tell a story about when he was a young prince sitting under a tree. So it's not that... It is not that when we wake up, we cannot remember the dream. 
but we no longer live in that room. But we can still say, ah, in that dream, I did that, that, that. I remember I dreamed this and this and this and this and this. But we no longer believe that actually happened. It did happen in one way, it was a dream. The dream is dream, but it's not reality. So likewise, yes, on one level, the I exists insofar as we don't become a, a you know, conscious for zombie when we get enlightened. I mean, on the contrary, it's when we finally come into our true humanity. But it means that we, as the Buddha said, I too use conceptual language, but I, do not, I no longer believe in it. And our problem is that we do believe in it. So when we say I, we're thinking me. When a Buddha says I, he understands that this is just a prefabrication of a dependent origination. It's not something... It's not that the I does not exist. It doesn't exist as an unchanging, solid entity. That's what it's been denied. It's not denying that all these causes and conditions come together and create something which we then nominate as I. But what it's denying is that our, our innate sense of something solid and, and distinctive and, and unchanging at the center of our being. That's what the Buddha is denying. He's not denying an, a, a, a changing process. And as long as we think of ourselves as a, an endlessly changing process, as a river, instead of as a stagnant pool, then we're okay. But it's just that we, we grasp at this sense of somehow there's something that's solid, unchanging, real inside me, which is me, in distinction to everybody else who is not me. That's our basic ignorance. Because if we search for that I, it, it never can be found. But the mind then opens up into something quite other. It's not that we don't exist, it's just we don't exist the way we think we exist. And we identify with all the wrong things. Thinking, who am I? Well, I am... You know, we give our name, we, we give our race, we give our nationality, we give our gender. Gender is a very important form of grasping. Um, we, we give our profession, our background, our, you know, our childhood, our da-da-da-da-da-da. If you're Indian, you give your caste. Everybody is very identified with this. And we think if we put this all together, this makes me. But it, this is just causes and conditions coming together which will then fall apart. And so on a conventional level, it's okay to say I, but on an ultimate level, what we think of as I and what we identify with as I is all the things that I am not. And the actual thing that we are, we don't even see, we don't recognize. And that's our tragedy, right? Because we make ourselves so small. When actually we are real false. Actually we are, have all Buddha nature, but we don't recognize. And my Buddha nature is not different from your Buddha nature. This is the point. This is why it's, it's compared to the sky. Because you cannot grasp it and say, this is my piece of sky. You keep having my piece of sky. <laughs> You know, I mean, here, you, you all come in, you, you have only been here two days, but, you know, and I, excuse me, that's my seat, right? But she's sitting in my seat, right? Who said it's your seat? So we can do that, you know? This is my seat, this is my house, this is my country, right? And we put up fences, and this is my space. This is the I sense, right? I am who I am, you cannot be me. But the ultimate nature is like the sky, it's like space. You cannot say, you cannot breathe my air. 
Like, this is my air. You came out of my air. Don't you dare put it my air. We're all breathing in and out each other's air the whole time. You know, so are the dogs. So are the trees. Isn't it? So therefore, the nature of the mind is compared to the sky. Of course, not exactly the sky, because we are conscious. The sky is not conscious. But the sense that you cannot grasp it, you cannot say, this is mine. And so the pure nature of the mind is like that. It, it's, it's infinite and only embracing. It doesn't, it connects us with all beings. It doesn't separate us from all beings. Whereas our sense of a tight little me is like, like our seats. You know, it separates us from everybody else. This is my seat, this is my identity. And this is why we suffer, isn't it? Because we, we identify with all the things we're not really, and we, we don't recognize our true nature, which is so incredible. It's beyond thought, literally. We cannot express the nature of the mind, because it is literally beyond the thinking mind. And all genuine spiritual paths know that. that, you know, the, in Christianity as it's Easter, you know, the Christ within. As St. Paul said, you know, it is not I that move, the, but Christ that moves in me. And, and so all, all genuine spiritual religions, obviously Hinduism, even Islam in the, the Sufi tradition, and in Christianity, Judaism, all religions know that the, the the task is to drop the little self and open it into something else which is beyond our ordinary ideas of self, which cannot be expressed in words or thought, because words and thought are by nature limited to the conceptual. It can be experienced, it can be realized, but it cannot really be spoken about. And so this is why wisdom goes along with compassion, because as we, as the great practitioners, as they realize this, then they see how sad that we are all, you know, in our own little prison of our minds. And, and we're trapped there, when by rights, you know, we, we should have <coughs> freedom, like those, those paragliders. Instead, we're all trapped. How sad. So the greater the wisdom and the greater the compassion. Because we realize what great potential we have. And how little we realize our potential. Very sad. I mean, terrible, tragic. That's the real tragedy. That we're all Buddhists and we're going around. And so many people in the world acting like demons. And at the best, we think we're just ordinary. Anyway. Ah! Okay, I just read that. It's the back of the page, but it said, the fact is that the majority of the population are ignorant of that good in nature. Right! That's the problem. Even Buddhists. <laughs> if our true nature is compassion and wisdom, how is it that the vast majority of us have no idea that this is who we are? If Buddha nature is what nature has created, how have we landed so alienated from our nature? Indeed. The fact that the majority of the population are ignorant of their Buddha nature and there is so much harm in the world makes it hard for me to believe this is our true nature. That's why I'm always asking, my dear, sit down and look. The only hope for this world is that, in fact, ultimately, we will wake up from our dream of ignorance. And that in it, our essential nature is beautiful. 
our essential nature is completely pure. It is complete intelligence and love and light. It really is. This is not some new age jargon. It truly is. That is why people throughout the ages have given up everything to go away and sit and realize that. Because we are beautiful. Never doubt that. Yes, we are alienated from our true nature, but our true nature is always there waiting. Just waiting. By, by, by the terms of eternity, this is just a finger snap. <coughs> it's nothing. It's like if you were a firefly, maybe you only live for a day, but that, that firefly, that day is a whole lifetime. So long and meaningful. And so we think our lives are so long, but they're nothing in comparison with the eternity. So even if it takes billions of years for us to come back to our true nature, that's nothing. But we can speed up the process through our practice. I mean, it's very important to understand that Ultimately, we are beautiful, and not that ultimately we are sinners. We are not sinners. That is just a covering. It's like a diamond covered in thick mud, you know? Thick, thick case mud. All you see is a great big ball of mud. And then we think, oh, this is me. I, when I look, all I see is thick mud. But it's. If you break open that mud, inside there's the diamond. And the diamond is not in any way polluted by that mud. However long it's been encased in the mud, it is always going to stay a diamond. Nothing you can do to stop the diamond being diamond. It's not in any way soiled. So however long it takes us to get back to our true nature, our true nature is very patient and waiting. It never changes. Super um, Oh dear, another one on this. I seem to get more this one. We speak of an atma, and yet we speak of a clear light mind as something permanent. It's not permanent, it's beyond permanence and impermanence, like space. Because it's ungraspable. So you cannot say it's permanent or it's impermanent. It's it's those are just, are just limitations of the mind. It's beyond mind. It's beyond permanence and impermanence. You use the word unconditioned. The Buddha used the word unconditioned. It seems very similar to the idea of Atma or soul. It depends what you mean by Atma and soul. Similarly, Dhammakaya is something permanent, unconditioned. The thing is that it, all of these are words. And the problem with words is that they are static. And, and the mind grasps at that and gives it a definition. I, I remember one time I saw this, this documentary and they were interviewing this Greek Orthodox monk. And he said that when they become, when they go into the novitiate, the first thing they are taught is that anything you say about God, or say or think about God, it's not that. And I thought, wow, yeah, exactly that. Anything we think about ultimate reality, it's not that. Because we can think about it. And if you can think about it, it it's, it's conditioned, it's not unconditioned. Right? It is still part of the mental process. But this is beyond the mental process. So whether you say Atma or you say Anatma, they're just words. It doesn't define what is. The experience is inexpressible. But we are always going to use words because that's how we are, you know, that's how we are limited. 
but we must understand that even the most refined words are a limitation, it's still the intellect, whereas experience is beyond the intellect. So you can argue forever about, recently we were in Srinagar at a conference on exactly this, on uh, uh, Buddhist Anatma versus Hindu Atma, self or non-self, from a Buddhist Hindu perspective. Anyway, the interesting thing was this very old Swami, who was in his 80s, and he was upholding the Vedantic point of view by quoting Nagarjuna. <laughs> he was in love with Nagarjuna. And it was wonderful to hear the karakas of Nagarjuna in Sanskrit. But he, his whole, wasn't it? His whole discourse was quoting Nagarjuna the whole way through. He didn't even quote Shankaracharya. He quoted Nagarjuna the whole way through to point, uh, to substantiate his view of Vedanta. So this is the point. You know, when, when you get to the, the actual experience, he loved Nagarjuna because Nagarjuna negates and negates and negates and negates and then just leaves it open, which is exactly the point, you know. Anything you grasp at, he cuts it away. Anything you grasp, oh, okay, it's not that, then it's that, boom. No, well, then it's this, boom. You know, so that in the end, the mind just, ah! <laughs> and then you get it. So um, that's the point. We can argue till doomsday about Atma and Atma. It's the experience that counts. Then we just go, ah. Oh. <coughs> um, we're actually supposed to take photos, so I'll just do it. I'll just deal with this little one because it's short, okay? And then we have to have our photo taken. Uh, how long should meditations be? Daily and on a retreat? Someone said sitting for seven hours was good in the party. <laughs> 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 yeah, really good. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, daily meditation, uh, if possible, an hour in the morning is very good. Uh, if you can't imagine an hour, then half an hour. Um, the important thing is not how long you do it, but how much we try to really put ourselves into what we are doing. I mean, we can sit for three hours with a very um, distracted mind or a very sleepy mind, and it looks very impressive, but it doesn't get you anywhere. You can sit for 20 minutes, but if one mind is really focused and relaxed and completely merged with the practice, then that will have so much more benefit. So if one is sitting, it's very good to um, tighten the, the meditation so that one, not tensing, being, the mind should always be relaxed, but the, the focus should be very clear. And so then really try to put oneself into doing the practice wholeheartedly, maybe for five or ten minutes, and then relax, just relax the mind, and then sharpen it again, and then relax like that. That's better than just trying, just pushing the mind um, beyond its capabilities. So we have to work with our own minds. Some people's minds naturally settle very easily. Some people's minds have problems. So it's better to have shorter sessions uh, of more, more completely um, focused and, and um, you know, that we should really put our whole being into what we're doing. It for, even for a short time, then relax and then do it again. And, and not push um, so that we just get tired and then the mind ha feels an aversion to practicing. Oh God, I've got to sit and meditate. The mind should gallop towards the practice 
because it's rec recognized that, that this is a good thing to do and it, it wants to do it. It's like if you're reading a book and, and you really enjoy the book or you're watching a good movie, you don't have to force yourself to concentrate. You're, you're, you're already immersed in it. So it, it's therefore, at the beginning, since watching the breath, watching the mind might not be as absorbing as a good book, keep the sessions short. Even if you, you're sitting and you don't move, I don't mean you get up and, and wander around and come back and sit down. Keep sitting, but keep the, the actual practices uh, short duration, then relax and then back again. That sometimes is, is, is more helpful. Otherwise, um, the mind gets bored, very, very bored, and, and uh, an aversion to, to sitting might arise. Then gradually, as the mind becomes more accustomed to being focused and relaxed at the same time, then the, of itself, the, the sessions will begin to uh, become more prolonged. Uh, it's just, it's like, you know, doing yoga or exercise or anything, you know, you start um, with short periods and then gradually as, as the muscles grow accustomed, you can do more. Likewise with the mind, if it's not used to being focused, if it's not used to staying on one point, uh, if it's even not used to being relaxed, then, um, you know, it's better to start uh, with small periods and then uh, Small periods, but many, rather than one great big long um, session uh, of trying desperately to keep yourself concentrated even when uh, the impetus has, has dropped away. Okay, so, and also on retreat, then usually, normally one does uh, four, four sessions a day, but the same thing applies, even if you have two, two hour sessions, you know, then again, you know, um, have times of, of really immersing yourself and relaxing a little bit, then, then back again uh, so that you, you don't feel the strain of it. And finish before you're, you're, the mind has gotten tired so that the next session one has the enthusiasm to start again. So um, one has to work with one's own mind. And um, see what works for oneself. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another because we're all different. Okay, so we are supposed to go and take um, a photo, a group photo. So please, everybody, come. Let's go in front of the temple. Okay, by the stairs.